Hello and welcome. Wherever you are in the world today, thank you for joining us for the Rise Traveler, unpacking conversations of sustainable travel. We are here to talk to eco-minded and socially conscious travelers, diversity and inclusion specialists, wildlife conservationists, environmental activists, and anyone using travel as a way to uplift and inspire. Together, we will go a step beyond the Instagram-ready world of travel and take a look at how travel can be a source of growth and development for all people and all communities. And now, here's your host, Amy Hager. With me today is Kim Haas, who's joining me from the New York City area. Kim, welcome, welcome. Thank you, gracias. Thank you, Amy. So I'm really excited to dive in a little bit more about what you do in this world. But I think the first place that I wanna start our conversation today is how are you connected to RISE? How did you find out about us? You know, I, I was so fortunate. I was speaking um, at the, uh, a conference in New York, uh, the Northeastern Conference for Teachers of Foreign Languages. And I was giving the, actually the keynote speech and then Vinci, so the, co -fa the founder, RISE, reached out to me afterwards and uh, we just connected and started talking as a result of uh, that conference and the speech. So I think we've just, it was so nice of her to do that and found that we had, you know, that um, felt a lot in common and a similar kind of viewpoint and so forth. So it was through Vinci and her reaching out, taking the initiative to reach out. I love that. And I think the beautiful thing about RISE is just, we know we can't do this alone and to connect and expand and really align with people who have similar visions and missions. Yeah. So it's just such a beautiful network of people. And so then let's talk a little bit about you. You're an expert in Afro-Latino culture. And I, to be honest, had never heard of that word until meeting you. And so can you share with us the passion and like, where did this journey begin and where you are today? Yeah, no, sure. And thank you. You know, so the, well, let me just say that the term Afro-Latino, I know, because um, I've been kind of working in, as you said, this area, and it's been just a absolute, an absolute love of mine for many years. And so it really, it refers to people of African descent or people who have African ancestry in Latin America, or they could be in the United States and they claim, you know, they're Latino and they also have, and they say African ancestry. So just like here in the United States, I'm African American. Mm -hmm. um, so my family, my background ancestors um, are of African descent, but here mm -hmm. in the United States. But if someone were from Latin America, then they may, but it's a term that I think is often used in the United States, but in the different countries, whether you're in Cuba or Colombia, mm -hmm. you know, people tend to refer to themselves as, you know, they're Colombian or they're from mm -hmm. Cartagena, you know, so it's very, it becomes nationalistic and people refer to the town they're from and so forth. So I think it's a term that mm -hmm. is often used more so in the United States, but it's a way of however people feel about it, you know, it's yeah. a way of giving name and categorizing people for good, you know, or, yeah. or not, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I hope that's helpful. That is totally helpful. And then, so then how did you start down this path and what really clicked for you? Was there, I think you had mentioned something about a time that you had traveled to Mexico. Yeah. So it, it all started. I, I give thanks to my grandmother who's, you know, no longer with us physically and here, but you know, she's spiritually, emotionally um, is still, you know, with me very much so. But when, um, when I was six or seven years old, she took me to Acapulco, Mexico. And I said, that was my first trip abroad. And yeah. I say that, and I said this in the speech at the conference that Vinci was at, I said, it, it totally changed my DNA. I said, if that's mm -hmm. possible, that trip really opened me up to um, wanting to meet other people and learning about cultures and traveling because when I was in the hotel lobby, a woman taught me to count in Spanish from one to 20. And I said, that absolutely did it. It changed my life. I said, it changed my tra the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. And after that, I wanted more language, more culture, more travel. 
And it was great because my grandmother loved to travel. So she took me to Hawaii and she just, um, she was just an incredible person. Mm-hmm. And she had this great spirit and vibrancy and generosity and kindness. And, and she didn't speak Spanish, but she knew she wanted to go to Mexico and she wanted to explore. And so I think she passed that down to me um, and I'm grateful. I love that. So then let's talk a little bit about the show. So mm-hmm. you have a public television series, Afro-Latino Travels with Kim Haas, yes. and it airs nationally on PBS, Create TV, and some local channels. And I think before we dive too deeply, I do want to have our viewers get a chance to watch a segment. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Okay. And I can tell you as you're, okay. Yep. Or I can just, I just set it up a little bit. This is in yep. one of the segments that we shot in Limon, Costa Rica. And we have two episodes, as you mentioned, that are airing on PBS as well as Create TV. So that's PBS's Lifestyle and Travel Network. Yeah. And this episode in Limon, the series is about celebrating and honoring people of African descent in Latin America because one out of every three Latin Americans has African ancestry. Mm. However, when you turn on the television and if you watch Spanish language television, if you watch something here in the United States, when you see the picture of a Latino, it's usually not someone who looks like me. Yeah. However, if you travel to these countries, if you travel to Cuba and to Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, and mm. if you travel to Mexico, I mean, there are people of African descent and yet we don't see them. They're just com- almost completely absent from television and media. And so yeah. I had this idea about easy 10 years ago that I wanted to show what I say is the glory and the greatness of people of African descent in Latin America because they're virtually missing from television. I mean, mm-hmm. again, if you can imagine nearly at least one out of three people and we don't get their talent, their creativity, yeah. all the wonderful things that they've helped to create and design in Latin America is just totally missing. And so I wanted to bring the television what the kinds of people that I was meeting, but I wasn't seeing on on the small screen. Mm, I love it. I love it. All right, should we go ahead and share the Yeah, so this is a dance scene at a school in Limon, which is on the Caribbean coast in Costa Rica. I love it. All right, here we go. All right. Yeshida Wilson knew how to dance before she could walk. As she stood on her father's toes, he danced calypso, salsa, and merengue. Now she teaches dance at Kun Limon, a center for the arts. She's inviting me to join the class today. Cross your fingers, I don't step on any toes. <laughs> okay, muchachos, vamos a iniciar. Hoy vamos a trabajar una danza africana exclusiva eh, y llamada bembe, que es una danza que viene de raíces nigerianas y esto fue traído a Costa Rica en forma de la esclavitud en tres diferentes tipos de culturas o tribus la Ashanti la Yoruba, la Yoruba los y los Congos hoy contamos con una invitada internacional verdad así que vamos a ver cómo nos va esta es la base y todo lo vamos a hacer en seis tiempos de dos uno dos Última. Esa es la base del bembé. Que la vamos a trabajar. No, we can do dance. Ese es el balón, él se acerca. Un, y dos, y tres. Ok, vámonos.
After an exhilarating African dance class, Yekshira and I meet up for a chat. Yekshira, muchísimas gracias. The class was phenomenal. Thank you. Phenomenal. I love every minute of it. You have such energy and presence and pride. You feel it all. Claro, eso es lo que tenemos que mostrarle a los estudiantes. Eso es lo que tenemos que aprender a transmitir. El baile o la danza son sentimientos, se expresan pasiones, se expresa lo que es la persona. Tell me about your teaching, the dance, okay. how long you've been in the field. Empecé a los 10 años. En, en Limón la cultura es explosiva, lo aprende desde que nace. Aquí se canta cuando se está triste, se baila cuando se está contento, eh, se baila en todo momento. El niño desde que nace ya está con los movimientos. <risa> Me, me apasiona trabajar con los niños que aprendan la cultura que tenemos acá, que la gente se sienta orgullosa de lo que son, yes. que puedan caminar y decir, sí, soy una negra nacida, un negro nacido en Limón, y así es la forma como vivimos. Eso somos nosotros. Well, where did this tremendous pride that you have, I mean, where did it come from for you? La persona tiene que saber quién es él. Mm. Tiene que entender cuáles son sus raíces, por qué aman ser lo que son independientemente de donde vengan y la condición de ellos económica, social. Ellos tienen que aprender a ser felices. Has that evolved? You see more of the young people with a sense of pride. Los muchachos, por ejemplo, son muchachos de diferentes eh, partes de, de la provincia de Lima. Y esos muchachos, tal vez como le dije, no, no pueden expresar lo que son en un papel, pero bailan, cantan con su cuerpo. Su cuerpo emite los movimientos de lo que tal vez piensen y de lo que estén expresando. Esa es la forma como ellos pueden decir, este soy yo, esta es mi identidad. Sí, soy negro, estoy orgulloso de él. Estas son mis raíces. Es necesario que el joven cambie la mentalidad. Entonces, estos niños están como con esa hambre de aprender. Mira, no sabía esto. Ahora podemos conocerlo. In your African dance class, you have people from a diverse background. Yeah, diversity. Primeramente, hay que mostrarle al estudiante que todos son importantes. Vivimos en un, en un lugar, Costa Rica, y principalmente Limón, tenemos mucha influencia. Tenemos gente blanca, china, chola, y en partes más alejadas, todavía tenemos cultura indígena. No pensar en un tono de piel, pensar que todos somos una cultura, que tenemos diferentes rasgos, pero eso no nos quita quiénes somos, ni de dónde venimos. Entonces yo considero que ellos se sienten muy bien. Ellos están felices porque pueden demostrarse sin problema y ahí se puede ver que verdaderamente podemos convivir, que podemos desarrollarnos independientemente una posición económica, un color de piel, Y aquí hay mucho, aquí hay mucho mestizaje. Hay mucho mestizaje. Wow. Well, cheers to you. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So that looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it was. Tremendous. They were great. It was just, it was absolutely lovely. Yachira is so, as, as she seems, I mean, so warm, super positive. It was great to be with her. And then the kids, I said call them kids, but the young people, you know, mm -hmm. dancing with them. And it was really a lovely, lovely afternoon. So then you've done the two episodes, San Jose and Limon. Um, so why have you picked Costa Rica to really yeah. begin shooting the series? And I'm also curious, like, what are some of the most unforgettable moments from the production of these episodes? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, so first, Costa Rica, you know what, because as I said, I came up with the idea like at least 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, so in order to have a show on PBS and on public television, you have to come with the show already produced. Got it. And people may not know that. So when they're watching programming, you mm -hmm. know, we don't get as producers, at least, you know, for starting out, um, you don't, we don't get funding from PBS. Right. So you have to raise the funds yourself. And it's been really unbelievably challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the, th in terms of just my life, I mean, professionally and personally, just one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. Yeah. Um, and so when I talked and would tell companies and corporations and foundations about the idea, again, at least 10 years ago, no one was interested. And when I said, hey, I want to celebrate and honor 
you know, people of African descent in Latin America. So in Brazil, talk about the mm. Afro-Brazilians who created Samba. I mean, yeah. Black people created Samba in Brazil <laughs> and in Puerto Rico. If you're familiar with bomba dancing, the traditional Afro-Puerto Rican dance that was created by Afro-Puerto Ricans as a way of communicating um, some enslaved and not. But so, so mm -hmm. much, the very, so much of what people enjoy in Latin America comes from Black people. And so I wanted to really celebrate that and honor that. And I just, no one was interested. And mm -hmm. so finally, you know, as the years progressed, um, someone was telling me, you know what, you just have to make the investment yourself yeah. and you have to pay for it. Um, and I had decided, yes, I'm going to do that because you know what, you have to bet on yourself as you know, you hear people right. saying that now, right. And yeah. believe in what you're doing. So I say that to share that with people. Um, and I was talking and met someone from the Costa Rica tourism board and told them about mm -hmm. the project and make a long story short, not long after it got the approval. And so they provided a lot of the in-kind support for us to get the crew there and to shoot. Yeah. So, but Costa Rica may not be the first place in Latin America that people think about when you yeah. think of people of African descent, right? You think Cuba and you might right. think Brazil. Right. You had mentioned uh, Brazil. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But Costa Rica has an Afro-descendant population. So many of Afro-Costa Ricans come from what were, their ancestors were from Jamaica, because a lot of Jamaicans came over in the early 1900s to build the Costa Rican Railroad. Oh. Um, yeah, so there's a big wave of immigration in the early 1900s, but then Blacks were there before in Costa Rica through mm -hmm. slavery and enslavement. And so Costa Rica's had a couple waves of Africans and people of African descent in the country. But this is my point. But when Costa Rica was talking about, and you see tourism, you don't see Black people. And thank goodness the Costa Rica Tourism Board said, you know what, we want to share some of, you know, our African roots yeah. and really promote Limon, which is on the Caribbean coast right, and is predominantly Black. Um, and so I'm so glad that they decided to take that leap and to really um, kind of celebrate all the wonderful things that Limon has to offer. Um, so then when you reflect on recording these episodes, yeah. I mean, just getting up and dancing um, on television, not sure I would be able to do that, but what uh, are some of the most unforgettable moments? Um, I'm clearly the people are absolutely amazing and to be able to interact with them. Yeah, you know what? We have two episodes. So the Limon, you just saw one of the segments from the Limon episode, but also San Jose, the capital. So there's an interesting, you know, look at a hmm. coastal city as well as a capital, which is kind of almost in the center of Costa yeah. Rica. And there were so many unbelievable moments and it's hard to kind of, you know, single out, you know, just for time constraints, a few, but you know, I mean, people don't see like the drone got stuck in the tree. You know, we had to call the fire department, you know, to come get the drone down. And, you know, there's another segment um, that I often show when I'm dancing in the park with a dancer named Shari. And she was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And after that, you know, I just sat on the bench and I almost cried because mm -hmm. I thought about this journey, how long it took to get to this place where I'm shooting with her. I yeah. thought about how much grace she has, mm -hmm. how beautiful she is, what a lovely individual she was and is. And so there were so many incredible moments. Um, we shot in what's the rainy season. So it was June okay. in Costa Rica for like two weeks, but I can tell you it never rained. It's just that one time you see in that segment. Oh, wow. And so I was like, somebody was blessing us. Somebody <laughs> said, you know what? Especially if you're she dancing worked. outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She worked and she worked so hard and persisted with this dream. We're just going to, you know, make sure it doesn't rain on her parade. <laughs> Mother nature um, is on your side. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we were very grateful for that. Um, but it was just uh, really just spectacular. I mean, from, like I said, yeah. even the drone being up in the tree and having to get the fire department down. Yeah. So many really wonderful moments with people that just I'll, I'll always remember it and cherish it. So then if we have to laser focus, mm -hmm. what is the purpose of the project and what are you really hoping to achieve through the effort? Well, I think the purpose is really um, because I, you know, I mentioned to people that, 
you know, of watching Spanish language television. And I used to work for one of the networks uh, many years ago. And, you know, a third of the population in Latin America has African ancestry or looks like me. But yet when you watch Spanish language television, they're not there. And so there's a total disconnect between what you see in reality when you travel to these countries and then what happens when you turn on the television. But yet there are accomplishments, whether it's music and dance or building the basic infrastructure of these countries. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned in the Costa Rica episodes, people of African descent, whether they're Jamaican Islanders emigrating you know, looking for a better life, looking for right. opportunity, right? The traditional immigrant story. Mm -hmm. They built the Costa Rican railroad. Yeah. And yet, you know, we don't see them. Know about it. They gave their lives. I mean, over 5,000 yeah. people died. For the first 5,000, they stopped counting after the first, the first 5,000 died building the Costa wow. Rican railroad. The Panama Canal. So much of that was built by, again, the same immigrants from Jamaica and other Caribbean islands, mm -hmm. building the Panama Canal. We're talking about the basic infrastructure of these countries. Mm -hmm. Afro-Mexicans have been in Mexico for 500 years. And yet it was only until, what, 2019, 2020, when they mm -hmm. were counted for the first time in the Mexican census. Wow. So that means that for centuries, people of African descent in Mexico we're not counted. And if you're not counted, it means that these countries are not seeing your value. You're not getting the resources. The attention is not given to you. There's so much that happens. So now they're finally being counted and acknowledged. Nice. So that's, that's what I hope is number one, just bringing greater awareness to right. these amazing communities in Ecuador. I mean, throughout Latin America, Peru, they're Afro-Peruvians. Mm -hmm. And making sure that their histories are known, you know, that we share in their culture and their accomplishments and people start connecting and thinking. And I'd like people to think differently about Latin America so that when you see someone who's Cuban, you know, right. think, let's think a little bit differently. That may be someone who looks more like me. Yeah. When you go to Havana and I've been to Havana, you know, when you go to Havana, half the people in Havana, good, maybe even more than half, they look like me. Mm -hmm or, you know, or any shade of brown. And so I really would like us to start thinking much larger and expanding our view of what it means to be Latin American. I mean, we didn't even talk about the indigenous community, hmm. right? And right. so, but my focus is Afro Latinos and doing my best to honor these incredible communities and incredible people who just go pretty much unnoticed. So then when you're looking into your crystal ball and looking towards the future, yeah. right? Like we're yeah. just going to predict it. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll just do that. Well, how do you see the future? Like there's been progress, right? right. And oh, there's absolutely. been incremental change, but how do you see the future of the travel industry of tomorrow, especially when we're talking about the African roots in Latino countries? Well, there absolutely, you know, has been progress, I'd say, because I can look at you know, from 10 years ago. And again, I don't live in Latin America, so that's not my daily, you know, experience. And I want to acknowledge that. So from yeah. someone who, you know, is from the United States, you know, um, but my, you know, just comparing it from when I started this journey, there's mm -hmm. number one, just a greater awareness of being Afro-Latino. People are now saying, yes, I'm Afro-Latina. I mean, that has changed. Um, you know, in Costa Rica, when we shot, uh, Costa Rica now has its first Afro um, Costa Rican vice president. So mm -hmm. Epsi Campbell, and we interviewed her, two of her sisters in the San okay. Jose episode. Yeah. She is now the first vice president of African descent in the Americas. Wow. I mean, that's tremendous. Yeah. Um, so there's organizations. I mean, so a lot is changing, but it takes a lot of work and effort by a whole lot of people Mm -hmm. to move cultures and change how people have been operating for centuries. Right. But I hope that through this show and we want to, you know, we're working on shooting other episodes. We still need support um, mm -hmm. because it's still a huge lift. But, mm -hmm. you know, our goal is to shoot throughout Latin America and show the brilliance of these communities, despite tremendous racism and oppression Mm -hmm. and the tremendous challenges, but there's some incredible people yeah. who deserve to have their stories told. And so I hope that that is our legacy that we help transform 
how people and how people think about Latin America. And it's no longer just people of European descent, but mm -hmm. it's much more inclusive. Mm, I love that. And I, that was the last thing that I was going to ask is what's the legacy that you want to leave behind, but that's, that's extremely clear and utilizing this project and your ability to tell stories, to interview, to create these shows then that air here and who knows where else they'll be able to air to really just bring that level of awareness to all of us. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, thank you so much. Gracias. Because it's um, my absolute honor and love. I love doing it. And I love traveling throughout Latin America and meeting, you know, people from all backgrounds and, mm -hmm. you know, but this interest of mine and Afro Latinos in particular has just been a tremendous passion because I could have easily been born in, you know, any one of these other countries. It's yeah. just that some ships went north and, you know, simplifying it and some yeah. went and more actually went to the Caribbean and South America than they did to what is now the United States. But um, I feel tremendously connected to the people and I love learning. I love learning about their culture. It's so incredible. What a beautiful journey. And thank you so much for sharing it with us today, Kim. I really appreciate it. Ah, thank you, Amy. And thank you all at Rise and Vinci. It's just been an absolute joy. Thank you. Gracias. Well, that brings us to the end of our journey today. And if you liked what you've heard and you want to hear more, please subscribe to our email list at risetravelinstitute.org slash subscribe. And we'll be back soon with another episode. But until then, keep roaming, keep learning, and continue to be a RISE traveler. Bye-bye. This podcast is an extension of the RISE Travel Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit committed to empowering young travelers through educational programs, research, study tours, and scholarships. Visit risetravelinstitute.org to learn more.